from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. The recent security breach of an Okta third-party supplier has been widely reported. The criticisms of Okta's response have been harsh. And the impact on Okta's value has been obvious. Investors shaved about $6 billion off the company's market cap during the week the hack was made public. We believe Okta's claim that the customer technical impact was near zero may be semantically correct. However, based on customer data, we feel Okta has a blind spot. There are customer ripple effects that require clear action, which are missed in Okta's public statements in our view. Okta's product portfolio remains solid. It's a clear leader in the identity space, but in our view, one part of the long journey back to credibility requires Okta to fully understand and recognize the true scope of this breach on its customers. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we welcome our ETR colleague, Eric Bradley to share new data from the community. Eric, welcome. Thank you, Dave. I always enjoy being on the show, particularly when we get to talk about a topic that's uh, not being well covered in the mainstream media, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. You've got some new data and we're going to share some of that today. Let, let's first review the timeline of this hack. On January 20th this year, Okta got an alert that something was amiss at one of its partners, a company called Cytel. It provides low level contact center support for Okta. The next day, Cytel retained a forensic firm to investigate, which was completed. That investigation was completed on February 28th. A report dated March 10th was created and Okta received a summary of that from Cytel on March 17th. Five days later, Lapsus posted the infamous screenshots on Twitter and later that day, sheesh, Okta got the full report from Cytel and then responded publicly. Then the media frenzy and the back and forth ensued. So Eric, you know, there's so much wrong with this timeline. It's been picked apart by the media. But I will say this, what appeared to be a benign incident and generally has turned into a PR disaster for Okta and I imagine Cytel as well, who I reached out to by the way, but they did not uh, provide a comment, uh, whereas Okta did, we'll share that later. I mean, where do we start on this, Eric? It's a great question, where do we start? And as you know, our motto here is uh, opinions only exist due to a lack of data. So I'm going to start with the data. Um, what we were able to do is because we had a survey that was in the field when the news broke, is that we were able to observe the data in real time. So we sequestered the data up until that moment when it was announced. So uh, before March 23rd and then after March 23rd. And although most of the responses came in prior, so it wasn't as much of an end as we would have liked, it really was telling to see the difference of how the survey responses changed be from before the breach was announced to after. So and let's, uh, sorry, sorry, to inter sorry to interrupt. Let's bring that up. Uh, let's look at some of that data. And if, as followers of this program know, let me just set it up, Eric. Every quarter e ETR, they have a proprietary net score methodology to determine customer spending momentum. And that's what we're talking about here, essentially measuring the net number of customers spending more on a particular product or platform. So I apologize for interrupting, but you're Not on this data right here. So, so take us through this. Yeah, so again, let's caveat. Okta is still a premier company in our work, top five in overall security, not just in their niche. Uh, and they still remained extremely strong at the end of the survey. However, when you kind of look at that at a more of a micro analysis, what you noticed was a true difference between before March 23rd and after. Um, overall, their cumulative net score or proprietary spending intention score that we use was 56% prior that dropped to 44% during the time period after. That is a significant drop. Um, even a little bit more telling, and again, small sample size, I want to be very fair about that. Um, before March 23rd, only three of our community members indicated any indication of replacing Opta. That number went to eight afterwards. So again, small number, but a big difference when you're talking about a percentage change. Yeah, so that's that sort of green line that, that, that was shown there. You know, not too damaging, but definitely a noticeable downturn with the caveat that it's a small N. Uh, but here's the thing that I love working with you. We, we didn't stop there. You went out, we talked to customers. I talked to a number of customers. You actually organized a panel this week. Eric hosted a deep dive on the topic with CISOs. 
And we have, um, if we could bring up that next slide, Alex, these, these are some of the top CISOs in the community. And I'm going to just summarize the comments and then turn it over to you, Eric. The first one was really concerning. We heard about this in the media. Ooh, ouch. Um, next one, not a huge hit, but loss of trust. We can't just shut Okta, uh, Okta off like solar winds. So there's definitely a lock-in effect there. We may need to hire new people, i.e. there's a business impact to us beyond the technical impact. We're rethinking contract negotiations with Okta and, and bottom line, still a strong solution. We're not really worried about our Okta environment, but this is a trust and communications issue. Eric, these are painful to read. In, in the end of the day, Okta has to own this. Todd, McKin Todd McKinnon did acknowledge this. Uh, as I said at the top, there are domino business impacts uh, that Okta may not be seeing. What are your thoughts? There's a lot we're going to need to get into in a little bit. And I think you were spot on earlier when, when McKinnon said there was no impact. Uh, it's not actually true. Uh, there's a lot of peripheral uh, derivative impact that uh, was brought up in our panel. Uh, before we even did the panel though, I do want to say we went out quickly to about 20 customers uh, and, and asked them if they were willing to give an opinion. And it was sort of split down the middle where about you know half of them were saying, you know, this is okay, we're going to stand by them, off is the best in the industry. A few were cautious, opinions unchanged, but we're going to take a look deeper. And then another 40% were just flat out negative. And again, small sample size, but you don't want to see that. It's indicative of reputational damage right away. Uh, that was what led us to say, you know what, let's go do this panel. And as you know, from reading and looking at the panel, all, a lot of topics are brought up um, about the, the derivative impact of it. And that, whether that's your own, you know, having to hire people to go look into your back end to deal with and manage Okta, whether it's cyber insurance or ramifications down the road, there's a lot of aspects that need to be discussed about this. Yeah, now, so before I go on, uh, and by the way, we, I've spent a fair amount of time just parsing, listening very carefully to Todd McKinnon's commentary. He did a, an interview with uh, Emily Chang. Um, it was quite, quite useful, but, but before I go on, I reached out to Okta and they were super responsive and I appreciate that. And I do believe they're taking this seriously. Here's a statement they provided to the Cube, uh, quote, as a global leader in identity, we recognize the critical role Okta plays for our customers and our customers and users. Okta has a culture of learning and improving and we are taking the steps to prevent this from happening again. We know trust is earned and building back our customers trust in Okta through our actions and our ongoing support and their secure, as their secure identity partner is our top priority. Okay, so look, you know, what are you going to say, right? I mean, they, they, I think they do own it. Again, the, the, the concern is the blind spot. So we put together this visual to try to explain how Okta is describing the impact and, and, and maybe another way to look at it. So let me walk you through this. Here's a simple way in which organizations think about the impact of a breach. What's the probability of a breach? That's the vertical axis. And what's the impact on the horizontal? Now, I feel as though business impact is really is, is the financial you know, condition, uh, but, but we've narrowed this to map to Todd McKinnon's statements of the technical impact. And they've said the technical impact in terms of things customers need to do or change is near zero. And that's the red dot that you see there. Look, the fact is that Okta has more than 15,000 customers and at most 366 were directly impacted by this. That's less than 3% of the base. And it's probably less than that. They're just being conservative. And the technical impact, which Todd McKinnon described in an interview again with Emily Chang was near zero, near zero in terms of actions the customers had to take on things like reporting and changes and remediation, basically negligible. But based on the customer feedback outside of that 366, that's what we're calling that blind spot and that bracket. And the, we list the items that, that we're hearing from customers in, on things that they have to do now, despite that minimal exposure. Eric, this is new information that we've uncovered through the ETR process. And there's a long list of collateral impacts that you just referred to before, actions that customers have to take, right? Yeah, there's a lot and uh, the panel really brought that to life even more than I expected to be quite honest. Uh, first of all, you're right. Most of them believed that this was a minimal impact. The true damage here was reputational and the derivatives that come from it. We had one panelist say that they now have to go hire people 
because, and I hate to say this, but Okta isn't known for their best professional support. So they have to go get people now in to kind of do that themselves and manage that. Um, that's obviously not the easiest thing to do in this environment. We had other ones express concern about, hey, I'm an Okta customer. When I have to do my cyber insurance renewal, is my policy going to go up? Is my premium going to go up? And it's not something that they even want to have to handle, but they do. Um, there were a lot of concerns. Uh, one particular person didn't think the impact was minimal. And I just think it's worth bringing up. Um, there was no demand for ransom here. So there were only two and a half percent of Okta customers that were hit, but we don't know what the second play is, right? This could just be stage one. Uh, and I think that there was one particular person on the panel who truly believes that that could be the case, that this was just the first step. And in his opinion, there wasn't anything specific about those 366 customers that made him feel like the bad actor was targeting them. Uh, so he does believe that might, this might be a step one of a step two situation. Now that's a you know, bit of an alarmist opinion and the rest of the panel didn't really echo it, but uh, it is something that's kind of worth bringing up out there. Well, you know, it, it just pays to be paranoid. I mean, you know, it was reported that this, supposedly this hack was done by a 16 year old in England out of his you know, mother's house, but who knows? You know, uh, other actors might have paid that individual to see what they could do. It could have been a little bit of reconnaissance, throw the pawn in there and, 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 and see how, you know, what the response is like. Um, so I want to parse some of Todd McKinnon's statements from that Bloomberg interview. Look, we've always, you and I both have been impressed with Okta and Todd McKinnon's management, decisions, execution, leadership, super impressive individual, you know, big fans of, of the company. And in the interview, it looked like you know, <laughs> look at the guy hadn't slept in three weeks, so really you have to feel for him. But I think there are some statements that have to be unpacked. The first one, McKinnon took responsibility and talked about how it'll be transparent about steps they're taking in the future to avoid you know, similar you know, problems. We talked about the near zero uh, technical impact. We don't need to, to go there anymore. But Eric, the two things that struck me as communication misfires were the last two especially the penultimate statement there that quote, the competitor product was at fault for this breach. You know, by the way, I believe this to be true. Evidently, Cytel was not using Okta as its identity access platform. You know, we're all trying to figure out who that, that is. I can tell you it definitely was not CyberArk. We're still digging to find out who, but you know, you, you can't say in my view, we are taking responsibility and then later say it was the competitor's fault. And I know that's not what he meant, but, but it, that's kind of how it came across. And even if it's true, you just don't say that later in a conversa conversation after saying that we own it. Now, on the last point, love your thoughts on this, Eric. My first reaction was Okta's throwing Cytel under the bus. You know, Okta's asking for forgiveness from its customers, but it just shot its partner and I, I kind of get it. This shows that they're taking action, but I would have preferred something like, look, we've suspended our use of Cytel for the time being, pending a more detailed review. We've shut down that relationship to block any exposures. Our focus right now is on customers, and we'll take a look at that down the road. But I have to say, in looking at the timeline, it looks like Cytel did hide the ball a little bit, and so you can't blame them. And, and I, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll go back to my panelists again, who uh, unanimously agreed this was a masterclass in how not to handle crisis management. Um, and I do feel for them. They're a fantastic management team. The acquisition of Off Zero alone was just such a brilliant move that you have to kind of wonder what went wrong here. They clearly were blindsided. I agree with you that Cytel was not forthcoming quickly enough. Um, and I have a feeling that that's what cut them, you know, got them in this position in a bad PR. However, you can't go ahead and fire your partner and then turn around and ask other people not to fire you, uh, particularly until a very thorough investigation and a root cause analysis has been released to everyone. And uh, the customers that I've spoken to don't believe that that is done yet. Now, when I asked them directly, would you consider leaving Okta? Their answers were, no, it is not easy to rip and replace and we're not done doing our due diligence. So it's interesting that Okta's customers are giving them that benefit of the doubt but we haven't seen it you know, flow the, the other way with Octa's partner. Yeah, and that's why I would have preferred a different public posture because who knows? I mean, is Cytel the only partner that's not using Okta as its identity management? Who knows? I'd like to see, you know, learn more about that. And to your point, you know, maybe Okta's got to vertically integrate here and, and, and start you know, supporting you know, the lower level stuff directly itself uh, you know, and or 
you know, tightening up those partnerships. Now, of course, the impact on Okta uh, obviously has been really serious, big hit on the stock. You know, it's yeah. pi that piling, piling on inflation and quantitative tightening and rate hikes, but the real damage, as we've said, is trust and reputation, which Okta has, has earned, and now it has to work hard to earn back. And it's unfortunate. All right, look, Okta was founded in 2009, and in over a decade, you know, by my count, there have been no major incidents that are obvious. And we've seen the damage that hackers can do by going after the digital supply chain and third and fourth party providers. You know, rules on disclosure are still not tight. And that maybe is part of the problem here. Perhaps the new law the House just sent over to President Biden is going to help. But the point, Eric, is Okta is not alone here. It feels like they got what looked like a benign alert. Cytel wasn't fully transparent and Okta is kind of fumbling on the comms, which creates this spiraling effect. Look, we're going to have to wait for the real near-term and mid-term impacts and long, but long-term, I personally believe Okta is going to be fine, but they're going to have to sacrifice some margin possibly in, in the near to mid-term and go through more pain to regain the loyalty of its customers. And I really would like to hear from, from customers that Okta, uh, from Okta that they understand that customers, the impact of this breach to customers actually does go beyond the 366 that were possibly compromised. Eric, I'll give you the final word. Yeah, there's a couple of things there, if I can have a moment. And uh, yes, Okta, well, it was a great quote. One of the guys said, Okta's built like a tank, but they just gave the keys to a 16 year old valet. So he said, there is some concern here, but yes, they are best of breed. They are the leader. Um, but there is some concern. And every one of the guys I spoke to, all CISOs, said, this is going to come up at renewal time. At a minimum, this is leverage. I have to ask them to audit their, their third parties and their partners. I have to bring this up when it comes time. And then the other one that's a little bit of a concern is data-wise, we saw ping identity jump big from 9% net score to 24% net score. Don't know if it's cause, <laughs> causative or correlated, uh, but it did happen. The thing to be concerned about out there is Microsoft is making absolutely massive strides in security. And all four of the panelists said, hey, I've got an E5 license. Why don't I get the most out of it? I'm at least going to look. So for Okta to say, you know, hey, there's no impact here. It's just not true. There is an impact. They're saying what they need to say, but there, there's more to this. You know, their market cap definitely got hit. Uh, but, you know, I think over time, if the market stabilized, we can see that recover. It's a great management team. But they did just open the door for a big, big player like Microsoft. And you and I also both know that there's a lot of emerging names out there too that would like to, you know, take a little bit of, of share. And, you know, but here's the thing. I'll, I'll keep going here for a minute. I mean, Microsoft got hit by lapses. NVIDIA got hit by, by lapses. Yeah. But I think, I, Eric, I feel like people, oh yeah, Microsoft, they get hit all the time. They're kind of used to it with Microsoft, right? So that's why I'm saying it's really, it's really interesting here. Customers want to consolidate their security portfolio and the number of tools that they have. You know, but then you look at something like this and you say, okay, we're narrowing the blast radius. You know, maybe we have to rethink that and that creates more complexity. And so it's a very complicated situation. But you know, your point about Microsoft is ironic, right? Because you know, when you see Microsoft, Amazon, you know, customers get hit all the time and it's oftentimes the fault of the, the, the customer uh, you know, or the partner. And so it seems like, again, coming back to, to the comms of this, is that really is the, the, the one thing that they just didn't get right. Yeah, the biggest takeaway from this, without a doubt, is it's not the impact of the breach, it was the impact of their delay and how they handled it and how they managed it. Uh, that's through the course of 25 CISOs I've spoken to now, that's unanimous. It, it's not about that this was a huge damaging hit but the damage really came from their reaction or lack thereof. Yeah, and it's unfortunate because it feels like a lot of it was sort of, uh, uh, I don't want to say out of their control because obviously they could have audited the partners, but, um, but, but still I feel like they got thrown a, a curveball that they really had a you know, difficult time you know, parsing through that. All right, hey, we got to leave it there for now. Thank you, Eric Bradley, appreciate you coming on. It's always a pleasure to have you. Always good talking to you too, Dave. Thanks yeah. a lot. ETR team, you guys are amazing. Do some great work. I want to thank Stephanie Chan, who helps me with background research for breaking analysis. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight uh, help get the word out, as, as do some others. Uh, Alex Meyerson on production. Alex, thank you. And Rob Hof is our EIC at 
Silicon Angle. Remember all these episodes, they're available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcasts. I publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. Check out etr.ai. It's the best in the business for real customer data, real time, near real time, awesome platform. You can reach out to me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or at dvellante or comment on my LinkedIn posts. This is Dave Vellante for Eric Bradley and theCUBE Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, be well, and we'll see you next time.